If you interacted with a computer beyond using just Word or browser, you probably had at least a bit of interaction with the shell. The shell is the program which handles the instructions given by the user on the command line. It can also be viewed as a user interface of a terminal emulator, usually referred to just as terminal. On normal operating systems, we have a few shell implementations, each of which feels and works a bit differently. You probably heard about bash, zsh, fish or even ksh. Essentially, all of these shells interpret the commands and arguments that the user specifies, then they invoke these commands, and finally, they can connect inputs and outputs between different commands. Today, we're going to look at the smallest possible implementation of a shell that is still somewhat functional. The code we'll be looking at is from a project called Bubble Shell, which also comes with an accompanying article that explains how it works. If you're interested, I recommend that you check this article out. Here's the code that the article talks about. I'll scroll through the code first so you get a feeling of its shape and size. Now, before you get scared and tell me that you don't know Rust, let me assure you that we'll walk through the code slowly and the principles are almost identical no matter which language we pick. I just like to mix things around a bit so that we don't use C for every video. Right off the bat, immediately after we enter the program in the main function, we fall into the infinite loop, which is here because we don't want the shell to exit after each command is ran. And inside this loop, the first thing we do is we print the prompt. This is just to make the user input a bit more visible. Since I use the same character for my prompt when making videos, I'll change this prompt to a dollar sign to make things more clear. We call the readLine function, which blocks until we press enter and it populates the input variable with what we typed after the prompt. Before we continue, let's just look at an example of how we specify commands on the command line first. A usual invocation of a command looks like this. The first word is the name of the command and everything else that follows are the arguments we pass to it. If this command produces any output, it's printed to standard out so the user can see it. But another feature of the shell is to redirect this output to various other things, including files or commands. There are quite a few different symbols associated to piping, but we'll look only at the simplest one, which is the command to command pipe. The syntax for that looks like this. The command to can now look at the output of the first command and perform something with it if it wants to do so. Also, the second command can also take arguments like the first one. That looks like this. Alright, so now we have the user's input in this input variable right here. We first remove any white space from user's input, and since we decided to support the piping operator, we split the input at the pipe character. Now, as opposed to many other languages, which a lot of times produce an array when splitting a string, Rust produces an iterator. We then call the pickable method, which converts this iterator into a pickable one. This essentially allows us to pick the next value while we're iterating. After we have the separate commands, we enter this while loop, which essentially loops over all values of the created iterator. So now the command loop variable represents this part. We split this whole string at every white space and assign the first element to the command and all the rest of the elements to args. Now we know what the command is and what its arguments are, but now what? Let's scroll down a bit and let's just pretend that this pattern match right here doesn't exist for a second and that all cases lead into this section down here. This part right here sets the standard in variable to the standard out of the previous command if it exists or if it's the first command it inherits it from the parent. Then we check if there is any command behind the one we are handling right now and set the standard out of the process to piped if that's the case. If the command we are handling is the last command, we just inherit the standard output setting from parent as well. Finally, we run the command using the command construct from standard library. We just tell this builder what is the name of the command and what its arguments are. And we also set the previously determined standard input and standard output. The last method we call spawns the command and returns the handle in the shape of the output variable. It might be worth mentioning here that the command construct we used here is a cross-platform wrapper, but if we chose a lower level language and we had to be platform specific, this section might look a bit differently. For example, on Linux, the forking and execution of processes are two separate concepts. Anyways, after we handle all the commands, we check the output variable for any errors, and if an error occurred, we just report it, and if the operation was successful, we assign the handle to the previous command variable. 
After we handle all commands in the while loop, we check if any of the commands did run and if that's the case, we wait for the final command before we repeat everything again and show a new prompt to the user. Just one side note, this unwrap method here is just one of the ways of handling errors in Rust, but this bare unwrap essentially means that if an error occurred, just panic, which obviously for production systems is not okay. Now we can compile this example using the Rust compiler like this. This produced a binary called shell, so let's try and run it. You can immediately see that the prompt has changed to a dollar sign, which is what we changed in code earlier. Now let's try a couple of commands. For example, let's list the files of a directory. Let's also check if the arguments work. And finally, let's try to pipe the contents of this command to a different command. As you can see, we have a working, albeit very basic shell. There's just one more thing we need to cover, built-in commands. There are a couple of built-in commands in every shell. We'll only cover two of them, cd and exit. You might be wondering why cd. Well, at least on Linux, after a process is running, it can only change its own working directory, so there is no way for us to spawn a sub-process which would change the working directory of our shell, which is its parent. Looking at the section I told you to ignore earlier, we see the cases for both mentioned built-ins. In the case of cd, we try to extract the value of new directory from the first element of the arguments and if it doesn't exist, we just use root. Then we set the current working directory to the one we determined and print out any errors. Then in the case of the exit command, it's really simple, we just return from the main function and finish the program. We did it! We created our own shell! As always, there is worth saying that there are many more things which go into making a fully operational shell. Just off the top of my head, we skipped redirection, logic and control operators, as well as handling variables. And I haven't even touched the concepts which usually only appear in scripts. That said, I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again, bye!